Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for what we have learned already. We come before you now, believing that you will still speak to our hearts. And we pray that you speak from your very heart and speak to our own hearts in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to take your word seriously and to know that this is you, through your word, speaking unto us. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. In First Timothy chapter 5, we're looking at verse 22. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 22. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. We want to look at this message tonight, titled, Keep Thyself Pure. The life of a minister of the gospel and of a leader in the church is a composite kind of life, a complex kind of life. He has his own soul to keep. He has his family to watch over. He has his children to train. And he has the congregation of the Lord under his care to also develop, train, and bring up in the way of the Lord. In his own personal life, he needs to know what it means to keep himself pure. In his own family as well, he needs to understand to know what it means to keep himself and that family pure. And in the church, in the local congregation he belongs to, he needs also to know what he will do so that the sins that people may commit are not as a result of his encouraging them to commit such sins. Paul the Apostle wrote to Timothy, and he wrote to him in the capacity of a minister of the gospel. Although Timothy was a son in the faith, he was also a person that had the work of God that he was doing. And Paul the Apostle wrote this first epistle to him so that he will know how to conduct himself in the house of the Lord. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So, Paul the Apostle wrote this epistle to Timothy so that he will know how to conduct himself, how to behave himself, how to lead in the work of God committed into his hands. And he challenged him in the sense that the challenge was, first of all, personal. He wrote all this to him so that his own life will be according to the word of the Lord, according to the way of the Lord. And the way Paul the Apostle did it is to show in chapter 1 how he himself, Paul the Apostle, came to know the Lord, how he received mercy and grace and was forgiven of his own sins. And then he, cho he showed Timothy in verse 16, chapter 1, how be it for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. He was thereby telling Timothy that what he saw in his own life, it was not just his own personal consecration, his own personal life, it was not just well that that was the way he wanted to lead his own life as Paul the Apostle. It was to be a pattern to all other people that will also believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so he was encouraging Timothy, saying, You know the manner of my life, and you know the things I do. And as you have seen, these are the things that you yourself will have to carry out. Look at my life. Look at my commitment. Look at my obedience to the call of the Lord. Look at the holiness and the purity of life. And you follow after that because it's not just a personal, secret, isolated, secluded life. It's not just that, well, that's its level of consecration. But that I am raised up as a pattern to others that will believe on the Lord as well. Then he continued challenging Timothy concerning his own personal life. In verse 12 of chapter 4. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. It was such a challenge to Timothy. And this is still part of keep thyself pure. In your own personal life, make sure that you are born again. Make sure that you see my own pattern as I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You too, you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you have responded to the call of the ministry. And you need to be an example. All eyes are watching you. They watch your lifestyle. And they watch everything that you do. Therefore, be thou an example. You are like a house that is set upon the hilltop. And you cannot be hidden. All the people in the valley are looking up to you. Therefore, you make sure that you are an example. And Paul did not leave him to just be thinking in a general sense what it means to be an example. He said you'll be an example in words. That is the words that come out of your mouth. As a minister, you make sure that you think through before you speak. So that you are not speaking something, saying something, you have not thought through and then you are not able to carry out. Be an example in word. As a minister of the gospel, don't be a double-tongued man. A person that will say A on one issue, say B on that same issue. And when you compare those two things together, they are totally different. Be an example in word. Let your word be yes, yes. Or no, no. Don't let it be yes and no at the same time. Make sure that your word is trustworthy. Your word is dependable. And your word is according to the scriptures, according to the word of God. Be an example in word. Then he says, you must be an example in conversation. The conversation there, one, it's, uh, you know, the way you converse, the way you talk to people. And I will still show you in other parts of this epistle how he wanted him to mind his language with the elderly, with the younger people, with the men, as well as with the women. That if you are a minister of the gospel, you must have the clean life. That your conversation will show that you really know the Lord and you are an example to other people. Then the word conversation in the New Testament also goes beyond your talking to another individual. It also means your manner of life. We take sin, everything that you do. Are you moderate or are you extravagant? Are you living as the Lord Jesus Christ lived? Or are you living like perhaps Herod, like Nebuchadnezzar? Is your life, is your comportment such a moderate model to other people that they can follow? Your whole manner of life. And then he says in charity. That means in love. And if you want to understand the depth of the understanding of the Apostle Paul on love and charity. You need to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And then Paul the Apostle said, Timothy, you will not only preach it, your life will say it. You must be an example in charity. Then in spirit, even in your attitude, in your disposition. You see, there are people that you may not catch as committing a particular sin. But then when you look at their attitude, the spirit around them, or the kind of uh, motive they have, or the air, the atmosphere around them. Although you don't know what is wrong, you know something is wrong. You know that something is wrong the way they comport themselves. 
or the way the air, the atmosphere all around them. But it says in spirit, you will be an example. And then in faith, you will also have to be an example. And then he talks about purity. Now, in all this, he was telling him, Timothy, keep thyself pure. The devil would like to bring you back into the mud. Keep yourself pure. The devil would like to tarnish your life and stain you if he could. Keep yourself pure. And the devil would like to bring a lot of temptations in your way and make you to yield to sin. Keep yourself pure. And he told him the way to do that in verse 13. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. Now, a person that is going to be a successful minister, I don't mean that he, I don't mean that he's going to have large number of followers. A person may have large number, that doesn't necessarily mean that he's successful. I showed you on Monday, according to the word of God, the mixed multitude. You see, a minister that is after the crowd, a preacher that is after the crowd, a pastor, a student leader, or a coordinator that is after the crowd, may just collect mixed multitude together. And so, a person may have mixed multitude. That doesn't mean that that fellow is successful in the ministry. But then, if you are going to be successful in the ministry, you are going to evangelize, and you are going to bring people in, and you are going to keep to the standard of the Word of God. You have to give attendance to reading. There's no other way. Because, you see, you cannot depend upon the Holy Spirit without reading. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit has come, He'll bring to your remembrance the thing that I have said unto you. If you have never heard anything, if you have never read anything, the Holy Spirit has nothing to remind you of. You have nothing, therefore nothing will come out. He will remind you of nothing because you have not read anything. But if you are going to have the Holy Spirit reminding you of the Word of God, you will give attendance to reading. That means when it says give attendance, it means give attention to reading. And that means that you will read intelligently. You read your Bible intelligently. And you are not just reading to preach. You are not just reading so that you'll be able to carve out or, or bring out a message for your congregation. You give attention to the reading of the Word of God for yourself. Because of what the Word of God does in a person's life. Now when it says you give attention or you give attendance to reading, it means that one, you are going to read systematically. And you will see the way we, we do it in the church. We study Old Testament, we study New Testament. Because you need to balance up your reading of the Word of God. And you need to, of course, you as uh, leaders in the church, you need good commentaries. Whereby, if you are reading the Bible, you are reading the Word of God, and you have some uh, parts you cannot understand, you go to those good commentaries and they will be able to help you. And one commentary we have recommended for our uh, people, for ministers, is Beacon Bible uh, Commentary, BBC. And it's because, not that uh, those commentaries, the ten volumes, not that uh, they say everything correct in, in every place, but at least because they are leaning towards holiness. Because they are leaning towards a central thing. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. That is why we have uh, recommended that to our ministers, you know, time and again. Adam Clark's uh, commentary. It would also be a very good commentary for a person that wants to seriously study the Word of God. You want to know how to get the real deep truths out of the Word of God. Of course, if you are a real Christian that wants to study the Bible, you have a Bible that has at least the center column, that has cross-references. You don't just, uh, you know, carry a Bible that has no index at all, no cross-references at all. If you read something in a part of the Bible, it will not refer you to any other part. You don't uh, want something like that. And you also want to know how to use your um, concordance very well. Now, if you don't do all that, you're not giving attendance or attention to reading. You're not reading the Word of God intelligently. Not only that, if you are going to be a person that does the work of God effectively, 
uh, you will need to look at the tracts we have and the literature that we have and you give attention to reading you read them read those books and um, well at the time of paul the apostle there was writing but there was no electronic recording no cases obviously if there had been bible cases like the ones we listen to on mondays and the ones we listen to on on sundays he would have also said you listen to those bible cases and of course if he had uh, also recorded cassettes instead of just the writing that he had he would have pointed you to the cassettes as well and so you give attention to them and then it says you give attention to exhortation and to doctrine uh, if you are preaching and you do not preach doctrine, if all that you are doing is just emotionally stirring people up, and there is no content, there is no doctrine in the messages that you are preaching, you are not keeping yourself up to date in the word of God to keep the congregation of the Lord pure. And then in verse 15, it says, Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly unto them that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed to thyself. Remember, you have your soul to keep. Take heed to thyself. Remember that you need to avoid temptation at all costs. Take heed unto thyself. Remember, you need to overcome sin. Whenever sin comes and in whatever direction sin may be coming, you need to keep away from those temptations. Then you take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Unto the doctrine unto the doctrine you see as leaders in the church uh, the people you have in the church because of their flesh because of their own temptations because of their lack of the grace of god because of their carnality because of they are not willing to nail themselves to the same cross of jesus christ to be crucified with him there are times they want you to compromise with them the young uh, people will want you to compromise with them on marriage. And the women will want you to compromise with them on dressing. And the men will want you to compromise with them also in their business. And the families will want you to compromise with them to patch up and manage their children and give them responsible positions in the church. Never minding the, the life situation of those children. But you see, you need to take heed to yourself and take heed unto the doctrine. Oh, you'll say, that's not according to the doctrine of the Word of God. That's not according to the teaching we're receiving in the Word of God. I cannot compromise that way. You have to take heed unto the doctrine. You're continuing them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Chapter 5, verse 1. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and a younger man as brethren. Now he comes to the area of your relationship as a leader in the church with members in the church. It says that you will look at the age of people. Now you see in this church we have uh, endeavored to keep to the Bible. You see we, we come from different backgrounds. And we come from different tribes. And you see there are some tribes over here in, uh, you know, in our country that there is respect for the elderly people. But you see there are some tribes here in our country too that there is not that much respect for elderly people. And there are some people that although they are born again, although they say they are children of God, they have not read this part of the Bible. And even among us, among those of us who are leaders, there are some of us that behave and act as it is in our tribe. You know, in some tribes, uh, if they want to, you know, refer to a person like me, for example, even though you might be 20 years younger than I am, or you might be 10 years younger than I am, they just say, I want to go and see Kumui. Now, in some tribe, that's how they do it. Because to them, that is the way to just relate. And, uh, you know, if you can say that about the pastor, obviously you are going to say that about some of your members who are not even your pastors, they are your own members. And they may be much, much older than you are. If you stay in your own tradition and your tribe, you are just going to say, uh, Michael, and the Michael you are referring to is 20 years older than you are. And Paul said, Timothy, 
don't be an Igbo, don't be a Yoruba, don't be an Efik, and don't be uh, a Togolese, and don't be an Ebe, but be a Christian. And how does a Christian do it the way a Christian does it? Is rebuke not an elder, but in treat him as a father. Let that respect be there. It is part of your life as a leader, as a Christian. And then he says, the younger as uh, as brethren, which means then, as you look at, there is difference. If you are approaching somebody that is much older than yourself, or you are approaching somebody much younger than yourself, you don't talk to them the same way. Maybe in your tribe, they talk to them the same way. But in the Bible, they do not talk to them the same way. You see, in the Bible, that respect and that honor is there. And it is part of the lifestyle of the one that says he's a leader. A young, growing, upcoming leader in the church like Timothy. And then in verse 2, it says, The elder women, as mothers, that he so will find the elderly women in the church. And although they are your members, it is not that they are even leading you. It is not that they are even women representatives or women coordinators. That respect will be there. And you will show the respect unto them because of their age. Uh, you know, sometimes if you are uh, mixed together with our people, if somebody is uh, showing some respect to an elderly fellow, uh, another tribe will just uh, come in, another tribe's man will come in, and say, well, uh, we don't do that in our tribe. And he says, it's because you are Yoruba, it's because you are this. No, not at all. It's because you are a Bible Christian. If you are a Bible Christian in honor, preferring one another. You will see in the Bible where Paul the Apostle was talking to the Corinthians. said, you may have many teachers, but you have only one father. Because I've begotten you into the kingdom of God by the preaching of the word of God. And the demarcation is still there in the word of God. You have that respect and you, have, you are looking up to somebody that is older than you in the Lord. Older than you also in age. Now he says, and the younger are sisters with all purity. The younger as sisters with all purity. Now this talks about the personal life of Timothy. That Timothy was not just to behave anyhow to those uh, young sisters in the fellowship. And you cannot just behave anyhow to those secondary school girls in the fellowship. It should be with all purity. Your language with all purity. Your association with all purity. You are not allowed to just touch any of those young sisters just anyhow and say, after all, I am your father in the Lord. Uh -uh, your father in the Lord doesn't get to the point of misbehaving, of getting, the, getting that girl into temptation. And you yourself inflaming your body with temptation because you say, I'm the school visitor. I'm the school, I'm the student instructor, or I am the coordinator, or I am zonal leader. No, you, you behave to those uh, young ladies, young sisters. It says with all purity. And you know, this is why in our church here, uh, we have women's section and we have men's section. And uh, sometimes, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so surprised uh, how some people behave. I think... Um, it was uh, about a few weeks ago on a Wednesday. We finished a Wednesday meeting like this, I think, if I remember correctly. And um, I was to see uh, two brothers and a particular sister. And they were talking to me, and one of the brothers stood up, and uh, another brother uh, was standing. And they, when the sister wanted to uh, discuss and say her own part, uh, she was so close, and her body was touching the body of the of the other of the brother and she was uh, demonstrating with hand that uh, you know when we went there when this district and uh, when i told uh, this person and and uh, you know all the time her body was touching the the brother and the brother just stood there did not even move well i, I felt that ah uh, uh, what is all this so i stopped i said uh, how are you to this man you see your husband oh she said no so I said, this is all you do in your district. You have spoiled this, our church, for us. See how close you are. That your, your, your body is touching this other person. And this, well, if you can do this in the presence of the pastor, you people, what do you do when I am not there? Before you know what is happening, they'll, get, they'll become pregnant. 
you see if you are going to be a real child of God you keep yourself pure and you will not you know you talk at a distance uh, you know if you watch me when I talk to any of these sisters in the choir or when maybe a sister is leading crosses and I want to take over you know I stand at a place where she can see me and then she will leave I don't uh, go there and pat her at the back and say that's enough uh, you know I want to take over that kind of familiarity should not be there and uh, some of uh, even the sisters I could be their father naturally if I married early and yet I will not allow myself that kind of intimacy it is because I know the word of God the Bible but there are people that they take loss into their hands they are not keeping themselves pure but the Lord was challenging Timothy through Paul the Apostle and the Lord is challenging you today through the same writing keep thyself pure uh, do you know that even as a child of God and as a person that wants to balance up the word of God there is a kind of closeness you can have with your wife at home when you come to the church you don't maintain that kind of closeness you know in some other churches uh, the husband and wife will sit together in the in the church building and then they will put their hand their hand uh, behind the woman and the uh, people will say after all the husband and wife well if i'm a, if i'm a visitor to that church i wouldn't know the husband and wife and therefore it will be a bad example to other people we want to be very careful and sometimes you have just got married you got married last saturday and today sunday you want to be in church and then you wear the same kind of dress i don't know where you saw that and then you you have the same one bible were you not reading bible before you were married and then they sit down together in the same place and they'll be opening the same Bible together and put it on the man's lap and, the, and the, the woman will be opening the Bible on the man's lap because they got married last uh, Saturday. What a pity. It means marriage is the all in all in their lives. They don't, they don't have any other vision. They don't understand any other thing. Marriage, marriage, marriage. After three months, we'll see what will happen. And after one year, we'll see what will happen. You see, there are things that are reserved for the chamber, for the inner chamber. There are some things that are reserved for your home. When you're at home, when you come to church, you don't want to make anybody to stumble. You want to keep yourself pure. You want to keep the church of the living God pure. And so, number one, you keep your very self pure. You do not allow sin in your own personal life. But there's a second area where you need to keep yourself pure. Let's go back to that. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22. Lay hands suddenly on no man. Lay hands suddenly on no man. Now, what does this mean? Is this talking about laying hands on people for healing? No, not at all. What kind of laying on of hands is this? Well, to understand that, you go back to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. That is, Timothy, uh, before he got into, into the fullness of the ministry, Paul the apostle with the elders or the leaders, they laid hands on him. And he's saying, Timothy, don't be in a hurry. It wasn't the first day I knew you that hands were laid on you. I watched your life. You traveled with me. You went places with me. I checked you up in comparison with other people. I saw that the other people were caring for, them, for themselves, the things pertaining to them. But I saw that you had a single purpose, a single mind. And I looked at you in every way possible. I tested you, I examined you, and scrutinized you to find out what was in your heart. And I knew what you will be before hands were laid upon you. Now, don't just suddenly, young man, don't suddenly lay hands on people. Please, turn the cassette over. Don't just say, well, we need workers, we need leaders, we need preachers, we need evangelists, we need this, we need that, and just get them together, just lay hands on them. For how long did Joshua stay with Moses before he laid hands on Joshua? You see that young man Joshua, he had been with Moses a long time. 
and they went to the mountain for 40 days. And Joshua was there on the, on the mount, and then they came down. After those 40 days of the mount experience, he didn't say, Joshua, I think you are committed. I lay hands on you. No. Do you know that even Joshua, when they were coming back, he said, I hear the sound of the word that the people have got victory. And uh, Moses said, no, this is not the, kind, the sound or the singing of those who are defeated or those who, are, who have victory. But it appears that this is a different thing. And then eventually, you know that uh, Joshua, uh, when he went back again to the, mount of, uh, to the mount, then Joshua followed him again. You know that he overcame the Amalekites. And even at that time, Moses will not lay hands upon him. And even when those uh, people were prophesying, and there were two in the camp that prophesied, and, uh, you know, he said, stop them and all that, envious thou for my sake, even though he had that commitment and attachment unto Paul the apostle, he didn't immediately lay hands on him. Now, you see, some people, they wonder sometimes the way uh, God leads me to do things. And they want me to lay hands on a particular individual and say that this is the assistant. But I'm not led of God to do that. And we just, you know, move together. And we see everybody. And we see the commitment of people. We see the endurance of people. We see how people can love the Lord. We see when God will tell them to bring their Isaac and sacrifice that Isaac to the Lord. And they pass through a lot of things before eventually the Lord will direct whatever may be done. But you know, there are people that they feel that immediately you see somebody that is promising, somebody that can preach, somebody that has a kind of anointing. Get him, get him around and lay hands on him. Timothy lay hands suddenly on no man. And you know, eventually, 40 years they had been in the wilderness like that. You know that when the 12 went to spy the land, as they came back, only two were faithful, Joshua and Caleb. Moses did not because of that lay hands on Joshua or lay hands on Caleb. You see, he left them until when it came to the time after so many years that now God told him, he said, bring Joshua and lay hands on him. Lay hands on no man suddenly. You see, I see that many of uh, you know our brethren here, you don't watch the way I do things. You think you understand everything already. And you are quicker than I am. You are faster than I am. You are impatient and I am patient. You will see the way, you know, I get things done. You know, you see, for example, as we moderate here on, uh, you know, Wednesdays like this. I put somebody now, this month, the following month, I look for another district and I put somebody else. The following month, I look for another district and put somebody else. You know, I'm very careful what I do. And if you check what I do, you'll see sometimes I put an Igbo. And sometimes I put a Yoruba man. Sometimes I put an Epic man. Sometimes I put the language people. And I say, you are to do this now. Now, do you think that I just do that? It's planned. It is planned deliberately so that everybody has a chance to be checked out to know how they do things, how they react. And you know, sometimes I will, even when I know that uh, somebody has not done something that uh, requires a heavy, heavy punishment, I, I will lay something on that individual like a coordinator I called tonight and uh, what he did, uh, it's, uh, you know, a minor, minor thing. And uh, so I called him. Actually, what he did is that uh, last Sunday, he, well, he came for the combined service. And somebody was to see me for counseling. And he knew that I might say that I want to see the coordinator. But then he said somebody should be in charge. He wanted to go and do something at the district. Now, it's something that other people will overlook and say, well, he's eager for the work of God and he's very zealous for the work of God. That's why he went to the district to do that. But, you know, I don't take chances like that. So I called that coordinator and I said, what did you do last uh, Sunday? You said somebody should deputize for you and you knew that I might call you. How did you act like that? And I was kind of heavy upon him. And I was watching him. I do that on purpose. It wasn't something too big. It wasn't it's something that I could even overlook. I wanted to see his reaction to rebuke. I wanted to see his reaction to correction. I wanted to see whether I would say, after all, I was serving the Lord. I went to serve the Lord over there. That's what I was watching for. Now, except that I'm preaching now that he is hearing me. I didn't tell him I was watching for that. 
But you know, I had to tell you so as to teach you a lesson. Uh, so, and he, he just said in an apologetic manner, I said, I will never, never do that again. And then, you know, even after he said, I will never, never do that again, I said, you slighted the pastor. And you shouldn't do anything like that. Next time, if you do that, I will not appreciate it. He said, I'm so sorry. I'm so, inside my heart, I was saying, well, thank God for a man like this. Thank God for a person that can be humble when you rebuke him. I didn't tell him that except that he's here in the preaching now. You know, just in my heart, I said that. But you know, that's how to test people. You test them. You dribble them. You scrutinize them. You kick them here. You kick them there. And when they show that, there are people that really, they are, they are there and they know that they are there like the rock of Gibraltar. That no wind will blow them. That nothing will make them to leave the church of the living God. Do you know that it's at that time you will say, My brother, don't you feel the call to be a pastor? Don't you feel the call to be an evangelist? And then, in, in a way, you are laying hands on that individual saying, You are sending that person forth. But not the first week we meet that person. Not the first year that we meet that person. Um, one of the coordinators here will bear me out. That, uh, you know, I was at the IBTC because we have a program there with the campus brethren. And uh, a particular pastor had uh, said that he will turn over his church uh, to deeper life. And uh, this, uh, this coordinator had, you know, seen me last week. And I said, uh, you know, he even said, you know, the land and the congregation and everything, I want to hand over unto deeper life. And myself as well. And they had already told that coordinator that when I join Deeper Life, I'll be totally under control anywhere they want to send me and all that. I didn't just take that and say, let that church come and join Deeper Life. Because of, you might bring in mixed multitude. And so I said, coordinator, be patient. I want to see that pastor. And the pastor came and, you know, introduced himself and said a lot of things, talked about his church and the time he started and a lot of things. What will be my reaction? I said, Pastor, I love all that you have said. Why don't you stay as your church and then we can send literature, we can send cases, we can send people and leave you where you are and help you where you are, but don't uh, try to join deeper life. Now, you see, there are people that will say, Oh, thank God they want to join deeper life. When I said that, the man said, No, that I still want to uh, join deeper life. I said, It's going to be difficult because, you know, deeper life has a standard that we will not change. That here you are, you are a local church, and you are just about 400. And deeper life is more than 100,000 if you count our young people in Lagos alone. And you don't expect that 100,000 people, they are going to change because of your congregation. You know, our dressing, restitution, holiness, and everything. It may happen that if you say you are joining us, those people, when they hear the word, they will run away and scatter. Why don't you keep your people and we'll give you cassette and help you? He said no, that he still wanted deeper life. Then I dribbled him and I asked questions from him. I said, now you're on your own. As on your own, you are free to travel. You can travel anywhere you want. If you come to deeper life, all that is going to be curtailed. No liberty again, no freedom again. You can't just do anything you want. He said he knew he was still join. Then I said, you know, uh, you will still need to talk to your wife at home. Because, you know, when you come, you are coming with your wife. And if you come with your wife, think about it. The dressing and everything. It may break your family. Because your wife might say, this is too much. You don't want to break your family because of deeper life. Stay where you are. Then he said, I've discussed with my wife and she has agreed. Then I brought a lot of other things. And, you know, I was just saying this and saying, but you know, some people don't do that. They just say, oh, you want to join? Wonderful. No, it is not wonderful. You don't know who those people are. You don't know how many sorcerers are there. You don't know how many witches are there. You don't know how many familiar spirits are there. And you don't know how many of the mixed multitude are there. It's not a wonderful thing. That's why a church, a church like this is very, very careful. And you know, after we talked for more than I think, probably more than one hour. Then I said, I'll get in touch. We couldn't conclude. He wanted us to conclude. He had made up his mind. He said he was ready and everything was okay. 
and he said it was not because of anything and i said well how much are you receiving where you are now then he told me oh i said if you join deeper life you won't get anything near that anything near that and it's going to change your style of living. If you have been living, you know, at this level, joining deeper life is going to mean poverty. He said he will still join. Oh, I said, how are you maintained? He said, some people give him, you know, to help him this and that. I said, if you join deeper life, all those people that give you things, we're going to tell them, once you're a member of the church, you don't send offering to any pastor, you send the offering to the church. And therefore, all the offering is going to cut off. He said he will still join. And even after he said all that, I still said, you have to wait. Because you know, that's just discussion. There's no prayer yet. That's just discussion. God has not spoken anything to me. That's just discussion. I didn't get any revelation from God. That is just checking out according to the word of God. You see, this is how serious the word of God is. When it says, lay hands suddenly on no man. Keep yourself pure. And then it says in that uh, First Timothy chapter 5, and looking at it from verse 22, Neither be partaker of other men's sins. Neither be partaker of other men's sins. Now, you will know some people in the Bible, they were partakers of other men's sins. Here was Aaron, a leader. And the people came, and these people that came, you know what they said? They said, up oh, make us gods that will go before us. And you know that this uh, Aaron, he was a partaker of their sins. And as a partaker of their sins, you see, he just said, okay, bring your earrings. And idol worship began. Do you know there are some leaders and coordinators like that? The pressure of the congregation, the pressure of the people is uh, once the people say, do this for us, then they want to do it. I remember the, uh, the time that we were having uh, the leadership seminar here on Saturday. One of the brothers was answering a question on marriage. And I saw that that uh, answer is, uh, you know, it's giving a lot of liberty to people to bring their gift in an unscriptural manner. And I came to him and I said, brother, I called him apart. I said, say this to the leaders and say, from now on, this is what we're going to be doing. It's not going to be like that. And he was trying to explain to me that actually this is what we have been doing. Then I had to manifest the authority of the pastor. I said, go and say what I told you to say. You see, it is not just what the people want. It is what we know that must be given unto the people. So that they are not the people that are dictating the standard. So that they have no right to change the standard of the word of God. In the case of Moses, he compromised. And you know that when you compromise like that, the judgment of God comes upon the people that have committed sin and the people that are compromising. And not only that, if you read Ezekiel, we don't have all the time. Ezekiel chapter 14. When people come to a prophet, and then they say that this is what they, are, they want, they have the stumbling block, their idol in their heart. Then you know that if the prophet, God said, if the prophet misleads the individual, God says, I'm the one that has permitted that prophet to even be misled. And then in one of the verses, he said, I will judge the people, I will judge the prophet. Because you see that prophet himself, he had a compromising attitude. And you know, there are times that, you know, our, uh, there are times that the people in your districts, we like you to compromise on the standard of the word of God. And you know, when I was talking to that pastor yesterday, and one of our coordinators who brought him, he was there. And I said, uh, look, uh, if you bring your church, I don't think they can stay. I said, and that's after we have cleared all those points. I said, do you know what we do in our church? That in all our districts, we have a central message, because it's still one church. And I record the message. And we take it to the, uh, you know, districts, and the people listen, and the coordinator is just standing there like this. That, how are you going to do? If you join our church, in your location where you are, number one, another person is going to take over, and you have been a leader for more than ten years. And then, as we are sitting down there, somebody is going to take over, and the pastor that is far away at the central church is going to send cassette there. Will that congregation be able to listen to the cassette? Oh, he said they will. 
Well, I said, how do you know that they will? He said, they just went to the minister's uh, conference uh, forum uh, that we had in Lagos here, and that uh, my cassette was played, and all those pastors, they were so eager, and they were so happy, and they all listened. He said, if those pastors can listen to cassette, I think my congregation will listen to cassette. Well, you know, everything that I asked him, he just said yes. And I said, this is difficult. He said, it is easy. I said, this is impossible. He said, it is possible. I said, you can't join because of this. He said, we can join even because of that. He said, that's exactly what he wanted. Even after all that, I didn't say, well, welcome. You are now part of us. No, he's still waiting and I'm still waiting myself. And you see, many of us are not like that. You are too much in a hurry. You want to get this, you want to get that, and you want a lot of people to be there. But you know, if you listen to that message on Monday, I'm so much afraid of the mixed multitude. So much afraid of the mixed multitude. And if you look at a lot of the churches now, and uh, you know, sometimes what I see, uh, I cannot talk about it all. You have some of the women, they will cut, uh, you know, the, the address. They, they will sew everything properly, then they will cut it. For you to see their underwear. And they come to this same deeper life. And you will see some of them. They will tie that scarf. They will leave the other part open. They come to this church. And they do a lot of things. That uh, if it were not another part of scripture that says. And uh, when the disciples said unto Jesus in that parable. Do we go and uproot those tales? And Jesus said, leave them alone. Let's while you are uprooting, really you should uproot them, but let's while you are uprooting them, you make a mistake and uproot the wheat. Why it not for that verse? I would have uprooted a lot of tears. And you know them, you know where they are, but at least if we cannot uproot them, don't make them workers. Don't assure them of anything. Do not be a partaker of other men's sins. Take your stand and keep yourself pure. Well, I'm sure that you are just like I am. I told you on Monday that as we listen to all this, that the people that have the same mind that I have, we should join together. Here was Jehu. You see, Elisha the prophet has sent one of the sons of the prophet. He said, go to the house where Jehu is. And when you find him, call him apart. And when you call him apart, pour the ointment upon him. After you have done that, then run out. And then he went. And when he did that, he got to Jehu. And Jehu was discussing with other people. And he said, O captain, I have a word for you. And then he said, Which of us? He said, It's to you, O captain. And he said, Say on. And then he said, Come apart. And he went apart. And then he poured the ointment upon him, anointing that God had raised him up to do a spectacular work in the land of Israel and to exterminate all Baal worship as well as the house of Ahab. And then that young man ran out. Jehu came back unto the people. When he came, they said, what is the errand and what is the message of that man? Tell it unto us. He said, you know his errand and you know what he has said? They said, it is false. Tell us. Then he said, it is what, this is what he has said. Although the people said it was false before, immediately they recognized it was the voice of God. They all bowed in it. They said, long live the king. And then they, they, they went after him. And while Jehu was going, and he was going to the city where Jezebel was and all those people, the worshippers of Baal, then one of those people that he knew that had a right heart met him, he said, is your heart like my heart? And is my heart like your heart? If it is so, join the chariot. And he joined the chariot. And it is what I'm telling you today. I know God has called me like he called Jehu. I know God has anointed me like he anointed him. And here we are driving on in the chariot. And we are preaching the gospel so that all of Nigeria, all of Africa will hear the word of God. And here I come to you tonight and I'm asking you, is your heart like my heart? Is my heart like your heart? Join the chariot and let us move on. The same faith, the same Lord, the same standard in unity of faith, in unity of doctrine. Why don't you rise up and let's be united together. If our hearts are the same, if our hearts are the same, that will preach the same word and stand on the same truth and there will be no compromise.
can you keep to the standard? Keep yourself pure. The same gospel, the same standard, the same word of God, no compromise. Let us stand together in the word of God. Are you standing on the same truth? Are you standing on the same word? Lay hands suddenly on no man. Lay hands suddenly on no man. Let's keep to the standard of the Word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Our dear Lord and our God, we thank you very much tonight. We thank you, Lord, because you are spoken to us directly from your world. Lord, we thank you, Lord, because of how you have corrected us tonight. We thank you, Lord, because you have told us over and over again that we should lay hands uh, suddenly on sort of or no man, and that we should not be partakers of other men's sins, that we should keep ourselves pure. Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, because you have corrected us tonight of our impatience in our various districts. Father, we are praying that as you have corrected us, the grace to take it to your word, you will grant unto us in Jesus' name. Lord, every impatience in us, O oh God, that we take away from tonight in Jesus' name. Father, we are praying that you will fill our hearts with patience. Lord, that we will be so prayerful. And Lord, we will not uh, suddenly oh, uh, lay hold on any, uh, any body, any body O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Father, we are praying that, Lord, in our... Just saying that we need workers... And need workers in our various districts, in our various zones, that law will not just be bringing mixed multitude, but law will be prayerful. And law will do everything, Lord, in accordance with your word in Jesus' name. Amen. We have been taught tonight by a pastor. And Lord, we are living testimony to the fact that many a times we have not been doing things the way he has been doing it. Lord, many a time we are very, in fact, we are in haste to do things. Lord, when we are pressurized, we just, uh, we just uh, dance to the tune of the people. Father, we are praying that in such a way whereby we have offended you in such a way like this, that you pardon us in Jesus' name. Lord, many a times, 
Lord, when we just hear testimony, maybe about an individual, the next thing we want is to make him a worker, to make her a worker. Lord, without actually checking off the type of life that person has been living, Father, we pray that, Lord, the grace to do your work in your own pattern, that you grant unto us in Jesus' name. Lord, when the tabernacle was to be erected in the wilderness, you gave the pattern unto Moses, and you told him that he must do according to what you have shown him. Father, and he acted and did everything according to your word. Father, we are praying that, Lord, this great lesson that we have learned concerning Moses, Lord, that will not depart from our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. You told Noah to build an ark, whereby we provide salvation to the people of, uh, the, the people of all during the time of flood. And Lord, after everything, we are told that Noah did according to all the words that God spoke to him. Oh Lord, you have put all these things in the scripture so that we will know how to follow your pattern. That if we do the work of the Lord the way you want, to, uh, you want it, so then we will have success. Father, we are praying that the grace to do the work according to pattern that we be according to pattern, you grant unto us in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, the success that we desire. We cannot have it except we build according to pattern. Father, we are praying. We are so reverent. We have lost the pattern and we are now building according to our common sense. Father, Lord, that you forgive us in Jesus' name. The grace to go back to the word of God, to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, and to look through and to see how you have done it that we follow after your step. Father, we pray that you grant unto us in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, because you've answered us. Father, we are praying that the word of God that we have heard tonight, you will write upon the tables of our heart that we are so ever we want to deviate, that Lord, you will speak up and you will remind us what we have heard tonight and we will never deviate in Jesus' name. That we will always be led by your spirit and by your spirit alone so that we will do the work according to your plan in Jesus' name. Thank you, Heavenly Father, because you have answered us. Lord, we are so ever we have made mistakes in the past. And we know that we need to correct in our various districts the workers that ought not to be there that we have managed. Father, I pray the grace to take a stand in accordance with the word of God and do the right thing. Lord, without favor and without any compromise, you will grant unto us in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, because you've answered. In Jesus' name we pray.